You're listening to an episode of What on Earth is Going On. This show was originally broadcast on the radio at CFRC 101.9 FM in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. It is now available to you in this format with all spoken content unabridged. For more information, visit wogoshow.com. That's W-O-E-G-O show.com. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Well, good evening. This is episode six of What on Earth is Going On here on CFRC 101.9 FM in the Kingston area, podcasted to your computer or mobile device. Welcome to the show. My name is Ben, and I'm going to take you beneath the headlines to discuss the events, the characters, the forces, and the ideas that shape the human story today. Each week, we talk with somebody who thinks and thinks deeply about what on earth is going on. We live in a time of shifting paradigms, bizarre events, and unprecedented change. Why are such things happening? How did they come to be? And where are we all headed? If you have any questions or feedback about the program or the topics that we discuss, please get in touch. On this show, I'm often jumping on my soapbox and mouthing off with my own opinions. So if you disagree, say something. You can find the show online at www.wogoshow.com. That's W-O-E-G-O show.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Download episodes on whatever podcast provider you use. And most of all, make your voice heard in the ongoing discussion. But first, if you're listening to the show live on CFRC, then right now the 2018 Ontario election is underway. Polls close in less than three hours at 9 p.m. If you haven't voted, go now. Look up your polling location with your postal code at elections.on.ca. Grab your ID, turn off your radio, vote. Don't wait until the end of this program. You can listen to it later. And if you're thinking it doesn't matter, I don't like any of the candidates or any of the parties, fine. You don't even have to spoil your ballot. Ontario election law states that if you can go to the ballot box, you can declare your protest at that location without even marking an X on a piece of paper. If that's your choice, fine. Go for it. But go now. Are you still with me? Good. Congratulations on participating in an election in your democracy at a time when our institutions seem to be under threat. But these threats are tricky. They are insidious. They are hard to identify. Almost nobody is out there claiming that we should put an end to democracy for good, that we should scrap elections altogether, and that we should just install a dictator or an AI overlord. Donald Trump's claim this week that he has the absolute power as president to pardon himself may indeed place him above the law if he gets away with it, sort of like a king or a dictator. But the shift is within the boundaries of our world. It fits within our paradigm. But change is almost always incremental. And before we know it, our story and our customs and therefore the very things that underpin our laws will already have been changed. Apathy, naked hostility, growing polarization, lack of civic dialogue, the unceasing assault, on institutions such as the press and the rule of law, our often celebrated illiteracy and our day-to-day behavior on social media, all of these may just bring us to the same outcome anyways. Today, we're going to talk about climate change, and with that, something called science literacy. Coming up is a discussion with one of Canada's most well-respected and hardest-working climate scientists. Professor John Small of Queen's University. I encourage you to look him up. This guy is not just unquestionably smart and passionate and dedicated. He is trained. He has spent his entire career studying and learning and researching. He has tried to figure out quite literally as a biologist what on earth is going on. And yet placed side by side with a climate change denier's Facebook post, His word is apparently worth no more than your next-door neighbor's, no more than mine, no more than yours, and this 
is a problem. Not because Dr. Small should be elevated above the rest of us, but that his work should be given more weight than, say, some blog post I just whipped together. Now, I imagine most of you listening accept the fact that not only is our climate changing rapidly, but that the change is anthropomorphic, that it is caused by humans. I also imagine that someone who denies this isn't going to be convinced by what I'm saying or by my conversation with Dr. Small. So why bother? Because science literacy is not just about climate change, it's about everything. Who do you want fixing your car? A mechanic with experience or some guy on Reddit who screams about how car mechanics are out to gouge you and how do you tell the difference between the two? Who do you want teaching history and chemistry and literature to your kids? Someone who has gone to school and trained for the job? Or someone who posts YouTube videos about how chemistry is a joke and that evolution is just a theory and that history is, well, whatever we decide happened? Again, how do you tell the difference between the two? You have to be literate. Some debates need to be had, of course. The one culminating right here and now in Ontario with the election, that is a necessary debate, where no candidate or party holds the silver bullet to solve our problems. But the role of scientific inquiry, accepted facts, truth, in this debate and others is of crucial importance. The parties and the leaders can be evaluated as equals, but not the things they say, not their platforms. If one platform is measured, considered, vetted, costed, and one is not, shouldn't they be given different weights? Should we really be putting the two together as if it were an equal debate? Our leaders are entitled to their own opinions, but they are not entitled to their own facts. And we citizens must know and must learn to know the difference. Because who wouldn't want to ride into power on accusation and supposition and fabrication, pretending to be the truth. We need to be literate. Literate voters, literate citizens, literate participants in the ongoing dialogue. Because the conversation will go on, whether we like it or not, whether we speak up or not, whether it remains dialogue or becomes a shattering monologue. If we're going to live in a world where everyone has their own private, narcissistic channel of selfie-dominated communication to the world, unfiltered by the media or government or any other iron fist in a velvet glove, fine. But when we aren't posting cat videos and square photos of every meal, when we decide to say something of impact, to enter into the debate, as is our right, then we better know what on earth we are talking about, and we better be able to distinguish between fact and fiction, between what really matters as a debate and what really, really doesn't. If we don't, then all of this is going to end up very, very badly. Dr. John Small of Queen's University studies how ecosystems change over time in response to both natural and human-induced environmental change. Key topics include climate change, nutrient enrichment, containment transport, and the environmental legacies of acid rain, such as calcium decline in lakes. A large part of his research program is centered on Arctic and Alpine ecosystems, which are especially sensitive to climactic and other forms of environmental change. Professor Small is going to be inducted into the Royal Society in England in July, which is a very exciting honor, and we're glad to have him here. Dr. Small, thanks so much for coming. Oh, my pleasure. Mm. So in the world today, we're faced with a pretty critical issue of climate change, but paired with that, we're also faced with this idea of science literacy and the sense that a lot of people around the world are questioning the fundamentals of science. You have the flat earth movement, for example, of people who are rejecting, even if we can prove something with evidence, they reject even the foundations that that evidence is relying upon. So as we do with every show, I'm going to start with the first question, which is, what on earth is going on? That's a good question. We really are entering, in some cases, I think, uncharted territory. Uh, There was a time uh, when I was even younger, and I'm not that old, where I think scientists and evidence-based policy had a lot more respect. 
There's a lot of reasons people give forward why perhaps science and, and evidence is being used less and less. People blame the internet. There's lots of people that they blame this flooding of information that's not filtered in any way. But some of these issues are very serious. I mean, the two of the biggest issues I think of that are very serious where you really have to use science and evidence policy is perhaps in health. <laughs> and we have lots of examples of uh, movie stars and people with no medical training mm -hmm. espousing all sorts of advice, which is totally contrary to uh, years and years of detailed research. And the other is on many environmental issues. Uh, the environment affects us all. Um, and there's many, many things that affect uh, the environment and how they affect humans and the ecosystems around us. One of the big ones is climate change. Mm. And there's been a, a well-oiled, uh, maybe pun intended, campaign to, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, to cause some problems with uh, people understanding the negative impacts of human-induced climate change. And uh, I think it's very serious. And I think uh, the situation doesn't get much better. We always think we're making some progress. And the mm -hmm. different statistics come out to show that we haven't really made much progress. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a recent poll. I, I remember looking at it. Uh, nearly a third of Canadians don't believe human I uh, humans or industry mostly uh, are related to the recent climate change. That's, that's a stunning analysis. You know, in Canada, we didn't think of ourselves as educated and progressive often, but one third of Canadians uh, are not convinced. This is stunning. Uh, mm. This is absolutely stunning, given all the remarkable, detailed, multifaceted evidence showing that uh, human-induced increases in greenhouse gases is a major factor in, in recent climate change. Uh, and it's, it's really contrary to uh, the fact that one third of Canadians, based on this recent poll, think that uh, scientists haven't really shown this. It's stunning. There have been a variety of people in various parts of the world who, I, the number I always use was 99% of scientists working on climate change are convinced that humans, and it's a very serious problem and mm -hmm. humans are causing it. I, that number I used is 99%. Mm -hmm. There's a gentleman, uh, Dr. James Powell in the United States, and if he keeps compiling the key word here, peer-reviewed scientific publications. Right. These are real science, not wishful thinking papers. Peer-reviewed scientific publications looking at climate change. And he's come up with a number of uh, 99, over 99 percent of the scientific literature shows that climate change is, is being a major problem. Now, you might think, who's Dr. Powell? Uh, sounds like, you know, could be some, you see, you know, some you know, tree-hugging activist. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Powell's been president of several universities in the United States. He's, uh, he's remarkable. He's been, uh, he's, he's got all, several awards. He's mm -hmm. a massively published author. And uh, he's been on various science boards that he's been put on by, uh, uh, by for example, uh, pr previous President Bush mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, other, other Republican presidents. He's hardly... Uh, what one consider uh, that might be some sort of activist or whatever word you want to use. Uh, he's a very serious scientist um, and who had the confidence of co very conservative politicians to be put on major boards. And he comes up with these numbers. And people like that that are horrified at what the public actually perceives as climate change when the data are so strong mm -hmm. uh, to show the opposite. Why do you think this is, and forgive me for asking a, a scientist such a speculative question about society and culture and politics, but why is this happening? Yeah, well, partly uh, partly there's been disinformation campaigns. <laughs> I think that were very effective. Mm -hmm. um, so I think... Uh, you know, the general public doesn't read the scientific literature, nor do we expect them to. Uh, what what does happen is the general public. Uh, you know, you can you, you can just Google climate change, and you'll get all right. sorts of nonsense. In fact, right. some of it is paid content that you get mm -hmm. at first, and mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's total nonsense. And uh, you know, people who don't have the backing, and and I'm not saying people need to have the uh, you know can have this backing. I. Mm -hmm. I've just done renovations to my house. I can assure you there's a reason I call a plumber and an electrician <laughs> and a carpenter because I'm incompetent right. in doing that. Right. Uh, we, we we have that relationship that, you know, we specialize. This is why we have civilization. We have specialization of labor. Right. I don't know how to run this switchboard to run this radio station. You mm -hmm. do. So, I mean, there's, there's things. There's certain people in society like medical doctors and engineers. I don't go, you don't go asking me how to build a bridge. Right. Uh, you go ask a structural engineer or, you know, a mechanical engineer. Same thing. It comes to things like this. There's people like perhaps myself and others who mm -hmm. spent, in my case, over three decades studying the problem, doing research on the problem, dealing with the top people in the world, trying to find out what the real issues are. I take no satisfaction in saying we have a problem. Uh, 
but we, it, what's what's the problem is that there seems to be very little trust in in experts, and this is mm. some politicians don't help. They uh, anyone who's an expert, quote quote, becomes now being called an elite elitist, or right. it's what it's coming a point where an acad- being called someone an academic is like uh, you know like a, a negative, dirty word, a dirty word, basically, yeah. you know, or an egghead or whatever, right? Uh, and you know, politicians are are getting away with it, and it's a it's a funny joke, but the reality is. Uh, our lives depend on it. Mm-hmm. Climate change is killing people. Mm-hmm. Uh, climate change is causing devastating things to the to, not to the environment only, but to the uh, to to the economy. Uh, uh, you know, our our how much money we'll have in our walls is going to be very closely linked how much CO two is in the atmosphere, and uh, give, spreading a disinformation campaign and and causing confusion and what they refer to sometimes as manufactured doubt. Mm. Uh, and it, it's not totally new. There was manufactured doubt with the tobacco industry um, uh, when they were trying to get tobacco regulation. There was manufactured doubt when we tried to uh, stop um, CFCs with uh, UV penetration. Uh, there was manufactured doubt even the, going back in, in the older days with a whole whole spectrum of environmental issues. Right. Uh, so it is a problem. Uh, but I think now the stakes are extremely high. We're dealing with global, much more complex problems. Mm-hmm. And we don't really have the luxury not to listen to experts. Just when it comes to human health, there's a reason you go to a doctor and not, you know, chanting outside in your backyard. Uh, you know, <laughs> right. there's a reason we go to a doctor because these people spend 30, 40 years of their lives studying this problem. So there's almost a death of expertise. Right. And um, so some of it is the distrust or not distrust, just don't, people... You can Google anything and find anything you want. I can mm-hmm. tell you the earth is flat. I can tell you anything uh, mm-hmm. go, if you Google it. Uh, but in a peer-reviewed mainstream scientific literature, you won't find the earth is flat. And that's the same right. reason you won't find that climate change, human-induced climate change is not a problem. You're not going to find that in the peer-reviewed literature, at least not with 998 or whatever percentage. Uh, I, I use the analogy. Uh, Dr. Powell, again, uh, he, he, he pulled together all these papers. And the ratio I have is... Of the scientific peer-reviewed papers that conclude that human-induced climate change is a serious problem caused by humans, mm-hmm. caused probably by humans, he has the ratio I calculated one thousand seven hundred forty-seven to one. Wow! So I mean, that's one thousand seven hundred forty-seven to one. That seems to me like if you add that on on horses, <laughs> you know, you might right. bet, you know. Right. So and then I use the analogy. So that means that means out of one thousand seven hundred forty-eight papers, only one concluded that human-induced climate change wasn't a factor. I use the analogy, if you had a sick son or a daughter or your spouse, and you went to 1,748 doctors, and of those 1,748 doctors, 1,747 said you need to take this medicine, (laughs) but one said the other. Why would you believe the one who said the other? Right. Uh, and I think most people would, most people, not everyone would believe the 1,740. So why do they not believe the scientists when it comes to these issues? So there is a real serious problem here of uh, using evidence-based policy mm. in these types of issues. So um, so I think uh, that, uh, that, that, that is one thing. Uh, the second thing, we're giving bad news. Um, and there's, so there's a certain mm. sense of denial, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very easy. I say, you know, 1,747 to 1 say, we have a big problem. We have to do something about it. The one out of 100 <laughs> said, oh, what's the problem? No problem. We, doesn't, we don't have to right. put any money. We don't have to pay carbon taxes or right. whatever. We don't have to deal with it. Everything's fine. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a, that, in many ways, that's a, a more, a, you know, probably, a, you know, psychologically, it's much easier to go that way. Right. And secondly, many of the problems we deal with, like climate change, happen on slow, long timescales. Um, right. People tend to be, you know, we're, and I understand they're worried about their mortgage coming at the end of the month. Uh, I right. say things like in 10 years, in 20 years, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, well, that's, whoa, a lot can happen then, you know. And so so we're dealing with timescales, which is also a problem that uh, that affects people. So. so, you know, this is very interesting because it seems that you talk about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of papers to one. It's a ridiculous ratio. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet when we, when we think of this, a lot of people will ask, well, what is the one paper? Now that may not be a reasonable question when it comes to climate change or other subjects where you have such a ridiculous ratio of evidence against, um, theory or just some guy has an idea about something and likes the particular paper, whether of self-interest or not. But it seems interesting that the internet and social media has allowed that one paper to seem mm-hmm. equivocal yeah. to the 1,700 papers that are against it. 
Yeah, that's that's the big problem now. There's no filtering anymore. And there's also what I refer to as, uh, or not just I refer to, but there's the echo chamber of the internet. Uh, what That one paper gets reproduced repeatedly, repeatedly, uh, and it gives this semblance of, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and uh, uh, said this. And then you look at the paper and you go, what is this talking about? Uh, and so there, there's the filtering is gone. And I use the analogy. And I, I do this. Uh, that's why I, to some extent, stopped debating climate change on the, with the media. And the media mm. has gotten a lot better with this. But it wasn't too long ago I'd be even on, you know, very respectable stations like TV Ontario or something mm -hmm. talking about climate change. And I'd be there talking about this, that, and the other thing. And then someone would, quote, debate me. Right. And the debate, I mean, it was not no, not a scientific debate. It would pull out something, you know, this unpublished study from England and this, uh, you know, how do you debate something like It's not a scientific right. debate. Yet, I think to the general public, there was me sitting here. There was someone like you sitting in that seat, a right. uh, commentator there. And it looked, well, it looks like 50-50 to me, you know. Right. The problem is a basement blogger is not equivalent to someone who has been dealing with the subject for 35 years right. uh, full time research scientists. Now that, and then people say, oh, that sounds elitist. Well, call right. it whatever you want. The simple reality is a basement blogger is not equivalent mm -hmm. to uh, a, a plastic surgeon if you burn yourself. You That's know, right. you go and burn yourself, uh, you go, I'm going to talk to this basement blogger, I'm going to talk to this plastic surgeon with 30 years experience. There, There is this division of labor and we have scientists who their job, often paid by taxpayer money, I might add, mm -hmm. uh, and their job is to either, in a university, is to educate the next generation of, in my case, scientists or other educated people, but also to do research to find out what the answers are. And um, and this is where I, I think universities and academic scientists are so important and in some ways maybe haven't done the best job we can in communicating. Uh, basically, in the world out there, there are three main types of scientists. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, there's uh, industry scientists, and they have their own agenda, and that's fine. You know, they're paid by the industry mm -hmm. to research and to, you know, probably, you know, to some extent, let's put a positive face on it, but that's that's part of the system, and we understand that. But there's, there's industrial scientists, and they're, they're a separate category. They're not going to go uh, right. typically publishing on what's wrong with the product that they're making. You know, I mean, it's just not part of their agenda. They're probably not publishing at all. They're mainly just advising, and, and they're respectable people by and large, I think. Uh, there's government scientists, where we pay our tax dollars for government scientists to give evidence or give give data that is useful for uh, public policy. That's that's in theory. Right. <laughs> now, uh, uh, we have had some governments that uh, not until too re not too recently, uh, the, the word muzzling of scientists was used, that scientists mm. were not allowed to talk to the press or if they were, well, they say well, they were allowed to talk to the press, but in reality, functionally, they weren't. They said you have these communications officer. I used to call them the tongue police. But, right. uh, you know, you'd have to go, if uh, someone in the media wanted to talk to a government scientist, like I was at the I was at the International Polar Conference in uh, Montreal a few years ago, and it was it was embarrassing. I mean, uh, the international meeting, government scientists from all around the world in Montreal talking about Arctic science and Arctic climate mm -hmm. change, mm -hmm. and the Canadian government people are basically, you know, muzzled from talking to the public because uh, they're worried what they might say. You know, so this is ridiculous. So, uh, so and, and you know, when, so so and so right now it's gotten a lot better. Not totally better, but sure. it's gotten a lot better with some changes in government, but. That's the second group. The third group are academic scientists, people in universities. The people, government scientists, are not ba with the you know rules of academia and tenure and all these academic freedom. We're not bound by what the government says. We're not bound by what industry says. We are the ones who can actually speak freely about what we find and 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 why it's important to the people at large. Um, mm. And that's something we haven't done a very good job at. Uh, and there's a there's a lot of excuses given why academics don't engage as much as they should. Now, things have changed, and they've changed for the better. When I, I started my career 30 years ago, I, I cut my teeth on acid rain, and I was hitting headlines. And I know at that time there were colleagues, there were people who, who thought any time you talked to the press, you were somehow dirtying your hands or talking to the public. It was... This is very strange. I always found it strange because I thought the public kind of paid for the work in the first place right. with their tax dollars. But it was like, you know, you're blowing your own horn or, you know, whatever. And that has changed a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Universities now realize they have to engage in the public. But mm -hmm. we have communications departments at Queen. Every major university has the, – the, their goal is to get the researchers out to show that we're relevant, basically. So right. that has changed. But we're still not doing a great job on it. There's a lot of excuses not to do it. Um, one is uh, – the media will get it all wrong. Well, 
they'll get some of it wrong sometimes, I suppose. But to some extent, that the onus is on us to do effective press releases and to learn how to do interviews with quotable quotes and the way to actually run it, you know, to, to basically say things in a way that's very hard to get. Because science is complicated. We have to learn how to say it in a way that'll be interesting and, yeah. and useful. And it is easy not to do that well, but with the little effort you can do it well. Uh, the other reasons is is that, um, well, I hear the public will never understand what I do. Well, if you can't explain to the public what you do and why you do and why it's important, then you probably don't understand what you're doing anyway. So I don't even <laughs> listen to that one. I mean, that's just a ridiculous <laughs> comment, I think, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, and the, the, the classic one is uh, I'm too busy. <laughs> well, you know, sure. I think most people. Most people, general public, would be amazed how busy university scientists or university academics are. Right. I mean, you know, I think there's still this view in, in you know, Hollywood and something, you know, these, you're typically wearing a tweed jacket with uh, patches on yeah. it, probably smoking a pipe. Oh, you can't smoke a pipe anymore. But, you know, <laughs> sitting off in some commons room, having a brandy. I can assure you, my day is not like that. Right, right. I think most people would be kind of amazed how busy, how, how busy, uh, university people are actually well and i, I as, as a scientist also how rigorous your work is yeah, too. that's right and it's constant i mean you're, right. you know peer review the whole process mm -hmm. and so on and so forth so so there are there are lots and lots of excuses and finally the, there's a dangerous one that i found found quite serious is that some scientists have started self-censoring and by that meaning they have found things which are in fact important well they're often important but have negative effects and might be contrary to the government at the time for example or mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. and they're talk i've talked to them he says well you know next year i'm applying for this big grant and i'm going to need a letter of support from either this government or from this industry and uh, uh, i'd rather not go there if, if academic scientists start self-censoring there's no hope i mean with mm -hmm. all our protections if we're going to start self-censoring then uh, there really is no hope so the public deserves to know what we do in universities and elsewhere the public, by and large, at least for my work, paid for it. So uh, they and and it's it would help us because there really is this information void out there. But getting it out is not simple. Uh, there's uh, you can find anything on the internet, and and you know, you'll still do interviews where. You know, uh, someone will say the earth is flat and it'll sure. be like a discussion. Of, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, how about, you know, I would just say, well, you know, if I went into an airplane, I would assume that the pilot thinks the earth is not flat or else we're going to land up in the, the ocean somewhere. Mm. But uh, so it's, it's a complicated issue. It seems to me, it, it almost sounds like you're being too modest as a scientist and as an academic by saying that uh, you need to be better at communicating to the public. But I think that there's some onus here on citizens at large in Canada, in the Western world, around the world as a whole, to take responsibility and and listen to people who are experts in their fields, and moreover, to make sure that when the discussion is framed, we make certain assumptions that are obvious, that are self-evident. So for example, we don't go on television and have two people debate the value or the the vice of murder, for example. Yeah, we don't talk right. about how yeah. murder should maybe be revisited yeah. as a one-on-one -on -one debate. It's yeah. assumed it's that bad. murder is wrong. <laughs> yeah. Just like it's assumed yeah. that gravity exists. It's assumed that uh, that we there are stars in the sky and that there is daylight and nighttime. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, there are fringe elements who are totally allowed with freedom of speech to debate this and and to try to torpedo it but when it comes to the media and the public discourse i think it's our responsibility as citizens to say you have a right to say this but you're going to stay on the fringe and you're not to be equivocated with the mainstream thought yeah. because we in order to move forward we have to make certain assumptions that's right and society has moved forward to a large extent because of understanding of science and engineering and mm -hmm. and if we stop using that and you know we go in this downward spiral of not using evidence well the uh, well who knows what can happen sure i mean uh, and without that you know if you want a democracy you need evidence uh you know i mean right. this, we could just keep pushing this argument all the way to politics uh, uh if you could if you can start saying anything you want without evidence then how, how long do we have a democracy in in place so uh, that is another point. Uh, someone mm -hmm. can convince you, you know, we, we have to keep thinking. Mm -hmm. and, and there is another issue that we haven't done a very good job and we haven't, or at least the public hasn't grasped, is another poll, just all, again, all within the year, uh, of saying almost half of Canadians or about half of Canadians think science is largely a matter of opinion. 
Hmm. And this was this really stunned scientists. I remember even our new chief science advisor uh, mentioning this. That it was one of the most stunning things she saw. You know, opinions don't mean very much in science. <laughs> Data matters. You know, mm-hmm. it's not like you have a. I have a hypothesis now. Let's raise your hand. Whoever thinks this idea is a good idea. That's not how it works. You know, right. it's it's not a popularity contest. A good I- idea. A good hypothesis is a, only a good hypothesis if it can withstand the rigor of intense scrutiny and testing mm-hmm. uh, and uh, reproducible data. Right. So it isn't a matter of opinion. Well, and the, the plural of anecdote is not data. That's right, right. exactly. Uh, <laughs> and it, it's, it's funny because a lot of the discussions that we're having by people who mm-hmm. reject the work that you do or the, the, the assumptions mm-hmm. that we're essentially having to make by this, mm-hmm. again, this ridiculous ratio of hundreds and hundreds of scientists to one. The fact that this is happening, I think, betrays deeper conflicts in our democracy. Mm-hmm. I think betrays a deeper sense that perhaps people feel that democracy is not about evidence mm-hmm. and about progressing through knowledge and science, but rather about setting up a debate and letting everybody yeah. to their own devices. Yeah. And that that's not just dangerous for climate change. It's pretty much dangerous oh. to the whole idea of democracy itself. It, it is. And in fact, I, I like the quote of uh, Daniel Moynihan, uh, now deceased, but a well-known senator in the United States. And he said, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not to his own facts. Right. And I think that's a very good point, yeah. that uh, opinions don't mean very much in science. They don't mean much in medicine. You, know, mm-hmm. you get a medical opinion, but it's based on this foundation of fact. Right. And it's not like, you know, well, and you hear, well, I'm entitled to my own opinion. Well, that may be true in politics, but it, you're not entitled to your own opinion in science. You're entitled mm-hmm. to what you can prove. Mm-hmm. Again, uh, You know, opinions don't really mean very much in science. Data matter in science. Well, and that's another important point that um, the what we talk about a lot on this show is the story, the human story today. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the world that's around us, the story is built on science. So Mm -hmm. um, this computer that's in front of me and the Mm -hmm. radio equipment Mm -hmm. that's around us, even this building, the way in which it it was built, the university and the buildings that are there, the plumbing, the electricity, everything is founded upon science and then engineering that science and turning it into reality. These are not opinions that were formed into concrete and wiring. These are not- Mathematical formulae. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) testing of materials. That's right, and testing in the same way that the scientific method is done. And yet, we're unable to see that all of this is the result of the progress of science as opposed to, say, the progress of people's debated opinions. Mm -hmm. But maybe people don't think about it enough. I don't know um, what's going on. I don't know if this is a case of apathy or uh, a retreat from science. Yeah, and and some of it is potentially we could start more in the schools, elementary schools, I would think, you know. Uh, I think a lot of people, when it comes to science, their eyes glaze over and Mm. To something they say, I, I won't understand. Well, they will if it's explained properly. People are intelligent mm-hmm. uh, and they can. And uh, and almost I think they think it doesn't affect them. But science affects everything. I Absolutely. mean, I talk to politicians too and I talk a lot to politicians. And, you know, it's almost like they sometimes think that let's use the environment, which is one of my fields, that, well, the environment isn't my portfolio. And I'm sitting there. If you go to Ottawa and sit around the cabinet table, everyone's sitting around that cabinet table. The environment is your portfolio. I mean, the environment affects the economy, which most people think of. The environment affects forestry. Mm. The environment affects fisheries. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, we keep going. Environment affects health. It affects tourism. I mean, just go down the go around the entire uh, cabinet table. So we that's the first step. And people have to realize the environment and science permeates every aspect of their lives. Mm-hmm. So I think some of it is just. Uh, it's an understanding and people and people always want to well there's the environment and the economy but the two are so intimately linked yeah. it's beyond words uh, Lord Stern it's probably about 10 years ago did the Stern report hardly a left wing you know but uh, you know a, a well known in the banking financial and he calculated the trillions of dollars that climate change that we're causing is going to cost I mean and it says the cheapest thing is to do everything in our power to stop it uh, and that was about 10 years ago. Then they did an update. He says he was an optimist when he did that report. Wow. It's even gotten worse because things are happening much more quickly. Uh, and to some extent, climate change, uh, you know, climate change is is could kill people. I mean, it does kill people. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, if you're on an island nation with a – I'm not saying every hurricane is caused by climate change. I've never said that. No respi- – rep- Reputable scientist ever says that. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying the flooding we had recently is because of climate change. What I will say is that we know enough that, yes, flooding and hurricanes always happen, but it's like 
like a loaded dice. Before it was maybe one and six, and now mm. we've loaded the dice, so it's two and six. Or right. a more negative analogy might be a Russian roulette. You had one, used to have one bullet in there, <laughs> now you have two bullets. Every right. time we keep adding greenhouse gases, we're putting a few more bullets in that in that chamber. So, uh, and so you know, I mean, so it is affecting people's lives. It's affecting everyone's life already, and mm. we only have the thin edge of the wedge. I mean, people my age, you know, I'll. I'm probably going to make it reasonably well. But, you know, if you have children or grandchildren, that's when you start worrying about it. Well, and I think you're hitting the point here and perhaps why so many people, I mean, th- we've talked about social media, the internet, mm-hmm. the, you know, the different ideas of what democracy is and the approaches to science. Perhaps there's another mm-hmm. more deeply psychological impetus here, which is that people are scared of what this means and uh, for their kids, their grandkids, mm-hmm. even for themselves. And it's almost as if if I had some disease or mm-hmm. a really bad feeling in my stomach day after day after day, well, there's a part of me that just says, if I just pretend it doesn't exist yeah, and yeah. avoid it, then I'll be okay and it'll just go away, which one, of course, anyone reasonable would say, just get it checked out. Yeah. Now, with climate change, it sounds so dangerous and so scary. Maybe I'll just cross my fingers and delude myself, even knowingly, uh, no, it's not going to happen, which is why the when the one person against the 1700 mm-hmm. uh, says that this isn't happening, I kind of want to believe that. That's denial. That must yeah. be a part of it too, isn't oh, it? Denial is definitely a part of it. And another one you hear that, well, scientists will figure it out. Uh, mm. Scientists will find a way. And, you know, the moral hazard. Yeah. You know, I'm uh, kind of not so certain. You know? I mean, this is a serious problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they hear, and again, the internet helps, you know, do your flame, you know, you know, fan some of these flames. Someone comes up with an idea of some type of carbon sequestering and, you know, and that's, that'll be part of the formula. It won't be the whole formula, but you know, then it's okay. They, I just read on the internet, someone, someone in, you know, Kentucky has figured it out. Well, I'm sure he hasn't, he or she hasn't figured it out. Uh, There might be a way of sequestering some of the carbon or doing something. Most of those have other impacts. It's Mm -hmm. not straightforward. Uh, and uh, the simplest thing is not to let the carbon dioxide into the air in the first place. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but you know, people always have, a, you know, a way that, you know, I know in 10 years, scientists will figure it out. Well, this blind faith in science. I mean, I, I believe in science, but I don't have blind faith in that they can fix things uh, mm-hmm. that easily. There's um, uh, a, a book that was written about 14 years ago by uh, Ronald Wright. It was called mm-hmm. The Short History of Progress. Yeah, I, I don't it, know if, yeah, 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 and it was the, actually the, the 2004 Massey Lectures yeah. that was turned into yeah. the book. Yeah. And he talks about Easter Island yeah. and uh, how the people of Easter Island believed in their gods and they believe that these muai, these sculptures mm-hmm. that they built, which are famous today, if you go to Easter Island, for tourism, yeah. <laughs> right, for tourism, of course. And but the 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 people of Easter Island believed this is hundreds and hundreds mm-hmm. of years ago, and it was a prosperous island. They believed that these sculptures, these gods, would save them, and so they would probably have been able to watch themselves cut down the last, last tree, tree. Yeah. on that island because there's a hill that can see all the other trees. They would have seen themselves cut down the last tree, knew what that would have meant, but still believed. Well, these gods will save us Mm -hmm. and that blind faith actually did lead them to almost complete devastation and it's sort of a a shipwreck of history that we can look back upon as a warning to ourselves but what if we were to take that lesson and perhaps other lessons what can we do to ensure our civilization's survival in the face of this denial well i mean uh what we have to do is i think first start listening to science Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know that would be the first step right uh not, uh, you know, there's, I would almost call it like a time, type of time theft. The, the amount of effort gone. Now, science has to be rigorously, uh, so the way science, the oxygen that moves science forward is criticism. So, so I, all ideas have to be constantly criticized and challenged to show that they're correct. I'm not saying anything that. But there's been all these diversions that uh, the money spent in these diversions trying to prove silly things or silly challenges could have been spent on developing better technology or better ways to to reduce carbon and and all these things uh the same is true in medicine i mean we've you know all these quack kind of cures for you know they've been in the news lately of diseases or or you know the anti-vaccine and all this uh, the amount of money going to show that these basically i'll say quack claims by and large are quack (laughs) 
could that have been spent on cancer research or something? You know, it's right. it's diversions of not only money but people's time. Uh, it's it's I call it time theft. Hmm. It's time that could have been spent productively in scientific endeavor, actually finding a something, a cure possibly, right. and instead it's diverted to non scientific endeavor simply because a movie star or an athlete, someone absolutely no scientific training makes pronouncements, has a glossy website, has a billion Twitter or whatever followers, yeah. and on 140 character tweets is giving out the cures for cancer or other important diseases. And that's just simply not how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, how we got to that stage is is worrisome. Uh, but again, it's like the death of evidence or what people refer to as the death of expertise. We have experts, but it's become fashionable to call experts elitists. Mm -hmm. We hear fake news if you don't like what the expert says. Well, it's dangerous. I mean, it's a, you know, democracy's at stake to some extent. Absolutely. So let's let's do this. Let's listen to the science right now. What is climate change, briefly, mm. if you can do it yes, briefly, sir. and what is it going to mean for our civilization, our species, mm. our planet in the next, say, 10, 20, 50, 100 years? Right. So climate change. So basically, climate change is naturally on a large number. I work on paleoclimate. I work on climate change over thousands and thousands of right. years. So there's very well good – if you came to this radio station – you know, 15,000 years ago, there'd be a couple of kilometers of ice sitting on us. We were in the Ice Age. Mm -hmm. Humans had nothing to do with that climate change event. Mm -hmm. We understand why that event happened. It's not a black box, you know. Mm -hmm. We understand the movements of the sun and why at certain periods of times it was colder and warmer. We understand that. What we also understand is that, if anything, we should be going more in a cooling phase right now. And we understand that by adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, it's, it's, increasing, uh, it's decreasing the amount of heat escaping and putting it in simplistic right. terms from the, from the planet. And so we're heating, heating up the planet. Now, why, why, is that, why is that suddenly happening now? Well, it's happening now because we're burning. If you look at coal and oil, that was once organic material, plant material of some kind that was buried 40 million years ago, 30 million years ago. Mm -hmm. And that was buried. So it was always this carbon was being stored in the earth. And everything's been more or less in balance, you know, amount of carbon going up, carbon going, because we... Carbon's taken in by plants, CO2 due to photosynthesis. So it was in balance. What happened once we started learning how to use coal and oil, the so-called fossil fuels, we were burning billions and billions, um, not billions, sorry, I'm just starting to talk like Carl Sagan. <laughs> millions of years of, <laughs> millions, yeah. millions of years of carbon stored in the earth. And now we're burning it within a year or two or 10 years. So we're greatly increasing the amount of CO2 or these so-called greenhouse gases right. into the atmosphere. So that's that's changing the entire climate structure of the of the system. So why should we care? People say it's kind of cool outside. And a few, what's what's one or two degrees? Well, it's a lot. It's, it changes so many things. It changes. Just think about the oceans. Um, one thing is warmer water uh, expands. So oceans are slowly rising by a variety of reasons. One is they're, they're expanding simply because of it's warmer, so they expand. Mm -hmm. Two, land-based ice, places like in Greenland and Antarctica. The ice is starting to melt because of warming. That ice that used to be on land is now going in the ocean. So slowly the ocean is getting higher and higher and it's inundating land. So if you've got, you know, oceanfront property, you might be pretty concerned right now and, mm -hmm. and there's good reasons to be concerned. On top of that, warming, let's just look at hurricanes. I'm not saying hurricanes are caused by human-induced climate change, but the likelihood of a Category 5 hurricane is much higher. Mm -hmm. So now you've got higher water levels inundating and you've got increased hurricanes and island nations are disappearing as we know as, as this mm -hmm. happens. That's, that's, you know, that's pretty serious. Mm -hmm. uh, we can have episodic weather like these flooding events. Now, not every, it, we always had floods, we, you know, that's what I'm saying, but, but we've increased the likelihood of rapid snow melt or, you know, the amount of accumulations right. and stuff. That's all adding to it. Uh, and there's some other things that are even not even directly climate, but linked to CO2. And when we're hearing about ocean acidification, right? Uh, CO2, if you put it in water, it's slightly acidified. If you have a glass of distilled water in front of you, uh, pH, the acidity of that, pH of that would be neutral, 7, if it's real distilled water. If you take a straw and you blow into it at CO2, because we exhale CO2, that w the pH will go slightly acidic because we made carbonic acid. Well, the same mm -hmm. thing's happening in the ocean. Slowly, with all this extra CO2, they're slightly, very slightly acidifying. They're slight. 
But having said that, even slight acidification is affecting shellfish and a lot of organisms. Right. And a large parts of the world get most of their protein from the ocean. I mm. mean, this is this is just one little sidebar, if you right. like, of the climate change issue. And you can just keep going on and on. Forest fires uh, increasing. Uh, you can go on while well, the list goes on. I mean, uh, you know, we all all hear about it. So it's serious. Sure. It has economic and it has people are going to, you know, people are dying because of climate change. Uh, and it's and we're only at the thin edge of the wedge. We've only seen small changes, and all the right. predictions are converging on much and accelerating, right. and we're not prepared. You know? Well, and one thing that our, our species for sure is founded upon is the need to live in a somewhat stable in Earth environment. Mm -hmm. We need a certain amount of oxygen in the air. We need yeah. to be able to get by without disease, diseases crawling in the, uh, in the atmosphere all the time. So, for example, there are unpredictable impacts of climate change, such as the spread of disease That's or right. yeah. uh, mosquitoes that carry malaria, uh, ticks Lyme that disease. carry Lyme disease. Yeah, I was yeah, just going to say that, which is on. a particular problem in the yeah. Kingston area. Yeah. I mean, to some extent, these are already existing, but they're exacerbated by yeah. exchanging climate. That's but right. the problem is, I think, that they're exacerbated to the point that we can't predict where these things will happen, where they're going to go, and how we're going to have to cope when all of a sudden the problem comes slapping us on the face. That's right. We're not prepared. It's already coming, and we're not prepared. And that's where adaptation comes in. Mm. Uh, you know, we, we have to stop, uh, you know, increasing the amount of CO2 going in the atmosphere. But we also, it's too late. You know, it's coming, or some things are already coming. Right. And so a significant part of our resources now have to go to what we call adaptation, getting ready for what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. Because we're not prepared for that either. Whether that's moving, if you're going to be underwater, you're going to have to move. Or if it's getting ready for, as you say, different diseases. Or what about crops? I mean, uh, right. you know, many of our crops are in already semi-arid type of areas. I mean, the prairies are are remarkable bread, so-called breadbasket of the world, but they're marginal for water, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it doesn't take too much more warming before you have droughts. And you want you know, these are billion-dollar droughts. I mean, these are not little. Uh, these are major, and also the food is no longer there. And you know, that food is not just for Canadians, but it's exported. So. Right. Uh, and uh, there'll be wars. I mean, you know, we we now have political ref refugees, and that's a big disaster. Wait till we have environmental ref refugees. We're not talking smallish countries here and there. We're talking millions of people that might have might have no choice but to move. And where are they going to go? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's. You know, we have to get ready for that. Well, and we're lucky. In in a way, we're lucky because for the first time in our history, we have the capability to look back and look at these shipwrecks of the past, whether they were in Easter Island or Mesopotamia or uh, Mesoamerica. We can look back and see how environmental degradation – not obviously the greenhouse gas effect, but other forms other of forms, environmental yeah. degradation led to civilizational collapse. Um, at a time, though, when if one civilization had collapsed, the other ones could continue. Unfortunately, we're bound together in one uh, international community that if one collapses, we pretty much all go uh, if, it's, if it's the cause of climate change. So I think what we're asking is, is because we can look back at the past and we have this privilege to be able to to go back and understand where we might be going wrong now, what what do we do? What can we do now? Well, uh, we could start listening to scientists. I <laughs> think right. would be my first right. suggestion. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, when it comes to specifically greenhouse gases, what we need to do is to, uh, the main thing is to decrease the the releases of the gas. And, and how do we do that? Well, Is that's it, tough. Right. Uh, I mean, that there are ways, but there are ways. Um, the usual three R's, reuse, you know, you know reduce, recycle. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly, uh, you know, we don't need to have our houses probably as as hot in in winter and as cold in summer. Right. Uh, we can insulate our houses. We can do all those types of things. We don't have to drive everywhere. We have better public transit. And Kingston's actually quite progressive in many of these. Just uh, it's quite mm -hmm. quite quite important to say as it certainly punches above, above its weight for a small city uh we you know so transportation's a big one we have to get different using different fuel i mean people i <clears throat> people say oh electric car we're never going to see it i i laugh when i see that i i show I'm about to give a lecture that at the environment summit uh, in muskoka on uh i'll give a lecture on thursday mm -hmm. one of my opening slides is a picture a photograph taken in easter morning in the year 1900 on the street in New York City. It's the Easter morning picture. And all you see is horses and buggies, horses and buggies. Mm. And if you look real careful, you'll see one car in the <laughs> middle, 1900. Then I show the same street on Easter morning 13 years later, 1913. Not a single horse and buggy. 
Wow. So <clears throat> it tells you two things. One, traffic in New York City has always been a mess. Mm -hmm. Two, <laughs> that things can change very, very quickly. So right. uh, it's coming. There's a lot of change coming. And p saying it's not coming, well, it's just silly. Uh, right. It is coming. So there, there is technology coming. And But, to, you know, uh, there is a lot of resistance to changing technology because a lot of companies, for example, have a lot of infrastructure invested in sure. stony you know, the famous quote is the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. You know? <laughs> we, it ended because yeah. we found bronze that was better and cheaper. <laughs> and the same thing here. There are better things coming. Mm. They're coming slowly that we're way behind schedule. We should have been way ahead of this. But we were so diverted by showing it's a problem. It's right. You know, the problem is we mm. were we wasted 20 years. I mean, I, I have a paper back in 1994 saying this is you know serious. I mean, it, it's it's been, you know, we. We have to start listening to scientists. We we pay scientists to be experts. Why don't we listen to them? We pay doctors to be experts. Right? You know, we pay plumbers. We pay carpenters. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, th there is a division of labor, and uh, to to say if you don't like what they say, call them elitists, mm -hmm. doesn't change the facts. The facts stay the same. Right. <laughs> You're entitled to your opinions, but not to your own facts. And, right. Uh, uh, you know, and it's, so it is complicated. It's not a straightforward. Um, and, and as you say, you know, a lot of the things that we need to do are, first of all, to listen to scientists. Um, but it seems to me that we have to win this debate, that, that the, the debate between climate change being caused, anthropomorphic mm -hmm. climate change uh, versus just, I guess, the mm -hmm. climate is changing because it always changes. I mean, d I guess that debate has to be won before we can move on. Uh, or, or is there a way we can sort of short circuit yeah. this? Well, I think to some extent, you know, the Paris Accords, to me, said... <laughs> The debate was won, right. but then the United States pulled out of it. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but I think within two years, they'll probably be back in. You know? Right, right. <laughs> See, right. there's a changing government. Well, especially because you know, it's not it's, it's, only, it's now the only country left, I think, that's not in the Paris. Yeah, I think it was that in it Syria. Was in or? Syria and uh, I think Nicaragua. Nicaragua was not in because they thought didn't think it was strong enough, and now Syria is going in as well. So right. essentially, of all the countries, there's only the United States that's not in, and, it, and it, I amazing. think it will be. But, yeah. you know, but the point is, that what people I talked to people on the Paris course said, so what? We just move forward. I mean, right. if you want to be, you know. You're going to well, have to join eventually. You join eventually and who cares kind of thing. We might know? as well start working on yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. We're not going to stop because, you know, one country's not there. So, so I guess that's the, that's the answer. So I think that. in some way we won. I think we won the debate. Right. On at least, well, supposedly on a political level. And now there's still a complexity of it's one thing to sign a document actually now to right. get those D decreases in emissions, but at right. least we at least we start the first step is right. The dark. At least we got direction. We don't have velocity. At least we have direction <laughs> shifting in our direction. Right. But uh, but no, it's it's not simple, and we're not done. I mean, uh, there's I'm not saying there's not massive challenges ahead, but saying that we don't have to do it is not going to solve it either. So is there? I don't know if there's a good answer to this question, but what's the time horizon? Like we all talk about, you know, climate change will have this effect and the number of degrees in 50 years or 100 years. But what's the time for time horizon? horizon for us to do something through government, through individual action, through group action. What? How much time do we have? Well, there's there's disagreement there, and usually every year it seems to get worse and worse because right. people say it's it's things are actually there's all these positive feedbacks that are hard to 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 quantify. But so I, I usually answer that by saying things are already getting bad. They're going to get bad much faster, and the sooner we without worrying about what happens when? I can assure you, every CO two that we don't send up is going to be good. You right, know? right. So uh, it's it's not good. Mm -hmm. uh, the forecast vary, and it depends where you're living. You know, some place, some places, and there'll be winners and losers too for at least sure. short time. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the other thing. Some and this is the other thing you see. You know, oh well, so and so is going to do better. Yeah, some parts of the world will do marginally economically better. If you don't take into consideration maybe the diseases moving in and, you know, you're going to... And uh, immense uh, maybe migration. Massive migration. Yeah. Where is that in your formula? Right. People tend to oversimplify the problem very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I, I try not to get into too big predictions. Some of them, some of them are pretty bad, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if we can keep the total under a, a degree and a half, which is very hard to do, but do, you know, mm -hmm. then at least it's, it's, it's you know, 
It's much more survivable. And it was all oh, the cost of doing that side. The cost of – stop telling me the cost of doing it. Tell me the cost of not doing it. Where, you know, right. Economists are good about telling you what things cost. How about the not doing it? It's, where is that in the formula? Right. And I, I've heard that uh, paraphrased by many people. They've essentially said, look, even if climate yeah. change is an if, even yeah, if yeah, we which can it agree. But even if, yeah, agree. But yeah. even if we yeah. can agree that maybe oh. it's not caused by humans or maybe uh, it's not happening, yeah. even if we were to go that far, well, still – the risk that it could be true yeah. should be enough to galvanize yeah, us sure. into action. And I guess, and yeah. the answer to the question about timeline, I think, is to make the timeline of our actions as short as we possibly can right. and to start to adapt now to what yeah. we know is coming. Yeah. And even if, even if everything we said about climate change is wrong, there's so many peripheral things with the burning of fossil fuel that cause problems. Right. Uh, health, you know, uh, <laughs> lung disease. Uh, the acidification of oceans. Which the is fact that we're going to run out. The fact, yeah, I mean, this list you know, goes on and yeah. on. Uh, fossil fuels are dead, you know, in, right. in, in the long term, they are dead. And mm -hmm. so, uh, and there's a lot of things you can do with oil and fossil fuels besides burn it. I mean, we make plastics out of it, we do all sorts of things. And maybe mm -hmm. our children, grandchildren, being smarter than we are, are going to figure out all sorts of other things we can do with fossil fuels. The, probably the dumbest thing is to burn it. I mean, it's right. used for something else. So so even if we're the 1,787 to 1 are wrong, <laughs> even if there's still all this peripheral stuff that is worth doing. Mm -hmm. I, th this has actually been a really hopeful conversation with you, and I appreciate that. I don't know if you've seen that. There's a show called, uh, um, by written by Aaron Sorkin. Is it called Newsnight? Or uh, I, I know of um, it. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm uh, trying to remember the title of it now. Right but anyways, yeah. there's an episode in it which, in which the uh, the anchor, played by um, Jeff Daniels, interviews an EPA official. Right. And this is before Donald Trump was elected, yeah. obviously. And the EPA official essentially comes on the air and says, "It's hopeless." <laughs> there, yeah, there's nothing we can do. And so the anchor is trying to say, yeah, yeah, but I mean, isn't there a silver lining here? Like if we act now and we put everything yeah. into place and we, we change our behavior, we reduce climate, we reduce uh, greenhouse emissions, surely there's something that can be done. And he says, uh, yeah, 20 years ago, but today we're screwed. And, you know, it's a very deeply upsetting thing to watch because you know that there are scientists yeah. out there who believe exactly that. There are some who think it's already too late or some of them are just so frustrated they don't care anymore. But right. as I say, the fact that I still rage means I still have hope. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I think has been really um, not only eye opening, but refreshing to talk to you today. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much. Well, my pleasure. Thank All right. You. That is our show. Thank you for listening to What on Earth is Going On. We broadcast to you every Thursday at 6 p.m. here on CFRC 101.9 FM or by streaming live at cfrc.ca in Kingston, Ontario. Remember that all episodes are available as a podcast, which can be accessed through any podcast provider and can also be found along with much more on the website www woegoshow.com. That's wogoshow.com. I would love to get your feedback, questions, criticism, and suggestions. And yes, I want you to keep this conversation going. Your quote of the week is from Malcolm Forbes, the 20th century American entrepreneur and publisher of Forbes magazine. Quote, The purpose of education is to replace an empty mind with an open one, close quote. It's important to know things, but also to know that we can't know everything. For us human beings, knowledge has to be shared. Knowledge is in fact impossible if it is not shared. We have to build on the knowledge of others, not constantly try to destroy and discredit and replace. Is there a chance that climate change is not caused by humans or is not happening at all? Yes, of course there is. A minuscule chance, but a chance. One paper versus 1,700 chance. Is the Earth, in fact, flat? Sure, maybe. And you might not actually be listening to what on Earth is going on right now. You might be in the Matrix, with your body heat and electricity being harvested by machines. But chances are... This is real. You really are hearing my voice. You really are supposed to think all of this through. Remember what Forbes said. Replace an empty mind with an open one. There's a difference between the two. Go ahead and be open. Be skeptical. But if you come back 
and reject everything just because you can, because you'll get more likes for being different and provocative, then you have done the opposite of what Forbes suggested. You have replaced your open mind with an empty one. Thanks for listening. Good night. Thank you for listening. For more episodes, visit wogoshow.com, that's W-O-E-G-O show.com, or search for What on Earth is Going On in your podcast provider. See you next time.